to a tree trunk. And let's say, um, you know, you carve it in there as an adult and you're at, it's at eye level. And 10 years later, you come back and it will still be at that same level. Okay, because the plant grows um, from the tips of the stems and the tips of the roots. It doesn't grow from the base up because of where these apical meristems are located. Lateral meristems are responsible for secondary growth. And so these allow the plant to increase in width or girth. Okay, so lateral meristems allow for an increase in girth. That's why um, gardeners... <coughs> Your mom or your grandmother may do this if you have plants that you take care of at your house. You know, when you prune them and trim them back, okay, um, when you pinch the plant, you can encourage certain kinds of growth. And that's because they're um, activating these different meristems. So let's do a little flower review or angiosperm review. Remember, angiosperms are flowering plants. Okay, and so... <coughs> Hopefully you guys remember a lot of this from your freshman year. This is, the flower is the sporophyte generation. And remember, that's the diploid generation here. So that's the main generation here in our flowering plants. Okay, and we've got the carpal here, which contains the stigma, the style, the ovary. Remember, this is the female portion. Okay, so the stigma has the sticky part on the end where the pollen can attach. Okay, and the style is where the sperm will travel down on the way to the ovary, where the egg is. And then the stamen, which is the male portions, contains the anther, which is what actually produces the pollen. And the filament's job really is just to hold the anther up high enough so that when the birds and the insects come to the flower, they will actually be able to come in contact with the pollen that's on the anther because it's up high enough on the flower. Okay, so continuing along the angiosperm route, let's take a, let's do a little bit review of the angiosperm life cycle, just applying that sporified and gametophyte generations. Remember the alternation of generations here. So starting over here where we have fertilization, okay, so we form the zygote. Remember that's the, it's kind of the beginning of the sporophyte generation because we're in the diploid aspect here. And so the embryo there. Okay, the embryo of the sporophyte forms, and it's going to be inside the seed. Okay, and so, <coughs> so the seed will eventually okay, grow into its own mature sporophyte, whether it's um, nearby or it's been spread around due to water or wind pollination, okay, whatever it is. Okay, here's our seed that will then germinate into its own mature sporophyte. That sporophyte produces gametes here in the flower. So the gametophyte generation for flowering plants is totally dependent upon the sporophyte generation. So here's the male gametophytes here, pollen, okay, and the female gametophytes down in the ovary. And so these are still on this mature sporophyte. You see they're right there. So they're still on this mature sporophyte. And once fertilization happens, you know, and again, hopefully this male gametophyte came from a different plant. Okay, but once the fertilization happens here at the base of the, um, there at the base of the style, once the fertilization has occurred and that seed will grow and develop on this original mature sporophyte, and then it will eventually fall off, get bitten off, be blown by the wind, okay, um, and it will form its own mature sporophyte. Angiosperms also do something called double fertilization. Double fertilization is unique to angiosperms, and it's one of those um, examples of an evolutionary adaptation that was crucial for success of these plants. Okay, it's what's enabled these plants to thrive and do well and to be the biggest category of plant out there. So let's kind of step, <coughs> walk through the process here of what happens with this double fertilization. So, with the, in the first step here, we've got the pollen grain that is going to, um, the pollen grain that's going to germinate, okay, and when it germinates, it's going to form a pollen tube, and a pollen tube basically is going to just work its way down the style on its way down to the ovary, okay, and if you notice, if you look at this pollen tube, there are two sperm cells in that pollen tube, which is going to be very important. Remember, we said it's double fertilization. So you need both sperm cells to fertilize once they get down into the ovary. So 
So we've now got these two sperm, whoops, we now have these two sperm here that are headed down the style on their way to the ovary. And our second step of the double fertilization okay, is that, <coughs> excuse me, okay, that the pollen tube will release both of these sperm into the, uh, into the female gametophyte, into the embryo sac, okay, which is different if you think about it in humans. Once one sperm uh, penetrates the egg, fertilizes the egg, it um, uh, does not allow any other sperm into the embryo sac. So in this case, the pollen tube releases both sperm into the, em the embryo sac here at the base of the ovule. Once both sperm are released into the base of the ovule, okay, you're going to have one sperm will fertilize the egg. Okay, so one sperm does traditional fertilization, it fertilizes the egg, and you get your zygote, your, and you're going to be able to start growing, starting your uh, sporophyte generation here. So you've got your diploid cell there with your zygote formation. The other sperm is going to combine with these two polar nuclei there. So you see two polar nuclei. If y'all remember from uh, meiosis your freshman year, we talked about how um, eggs, females only form, males form four viable sperm each time, but females only uh, form one viable egg, and the other three are polar bodies. Okay, well, plants do a similar thing. So we've got these two polar nuclei there. And so the sperm, the second sperm, will fertilize those two polar nuclei, and you'll end up with a triploid cell. And you can see here a 3N cell instead of a diploid or a haploid Okay, I've got three copies of the chromosomes here. Okay, and this will eventually, these, this right here, of this fusion of the two polar nuclei and the sperm, will eventually result in what's called the endosperm. Okay, and the endosperm is going to provide nutrition for the growing and developing zygote. Okay, so it's a nutritive tissue. And like I said, it's going to be supplying um, it's going to be supplying nutrients to that growing and developing zygote. So the double fertilization again is unique to angiosperms. Um, again, an evolutionary adaptation that really helped uh, solidify their success. Okay, so um, as most of you guys are obviously aware, angiosperms are also going to be kind of they're going to have a pretty close relationship with animals, okay? because that's what a lot of them are very dependent upon animals to act as pollinators for them. Okay, whether it's um, insects or birds, butterflies, um, here you've got a bat and a possum, okay, it doesn't matter, but they are, uh, the flower is dependent upon, the plant is dependent upon these pollinators. And so a lot of these pollinators and the plants have gone through what's called co-evolution together. Okay, they've had an impact on one another's evolution. A, their close relationship has had an impact on one another's revolution. evolution. This is a very, very slow process. A, uh, like, for example, let's say we've got uh, hummingbirds need a lot of sugar, and they can see red. So let's say we've got a red flower, and the hummingbirds have been going to the red flower, and then we've got a red flower, another red flower that produces extra nectar. You know, it's got nectar reserves. Well, the hummingbird is going to prefer that flower with nectar nectar reserves. And so now its DNA is starting to um, become more prolific throughout the population. Okay, so butterflies. Uh, let's look at the butterfly example here. We've got butterflies here that see yellow. Okay, so butterflies, you know, that's so pollinating these yellow flowers here. Butterflies are able to see yellow. So the flowers that a butterfly is able to pollinate are going to need to be yellow. It's to that flower's benefit to be yellow so that the butterfly can see it and will come over to it and pollinate it. Okay, um, what you have here with these moths. Okay, so that's a moth. Moths are out at nighttime. So if you think about what kind of flower a moth would need to, um, some of the characteristics that would help the moth be able to find the flower, well, a lot of times they're white. So they're easier to see in the evening time, and they have a strong smell. Okay, they're very fragrant, so the, it's easier for the moth to find it because it's dark outside. Okay, uh, in the middle here, you've got these bees. Okay, again, bees see yellow. Okay, they also see blue. 
and they also see UV radiation. So again, all of those would be good characteristics for the plant to have for the bee to be able to find that plant a little bit easier. Okay, as I mentioned before, hummingbirds. Okay, so we got a hummingbird here. Hummingbirds see red. Okay, and they need lots of sugar to get the uh, to be able to fuel the beating of those wings. Okay, and so red flowers with nectar reserves are going to be more likely to be pollinated by a hummingbird. Okay, uh, over here we've got bats and possums. No way that's going to fit. And the bats and possums both, again, are nocturnal. So again, flowers that are white, that are fragrant, they attract insects like these moths. Okay, it's to the flower's benefit to attract the moth or the insect. So then that also attracts the bat, and so the bat can also act as a pollinator. Um, you've got... An example of a tree in California, the California buckeye, that is pollinated by only sir, only native California honeybees or can pollinate it because it releases a neurotoxin in its pollen. The other honeybees are sensitive, but the local ones, uh, they are resistant to the toxin. Um, orchids have co-evolved uh, with insects. They actually structurally resemble some insects. So the males try to mate, and when they come and try to mate, they pick up some pollen. Okay, but again, the whole process is very slow. Okay, so let's take a look at once the plant has been pollinated, you said the seed is going to develop. <coughs> once the zygote has formed, the seed will develop around it. So let's take a look at some kind of anatomy of the seed, some stuff you need to know. You don't need to know every single thing that's on this diagram, but there are a few things that you definitely need to be aware of. Okay, so a mature seed... Okay, these are all these are just three different examples of a seed. Okay, a mature seed is going to contain you're definitely going to have your dormant plant embryo. Okay, so the plant has the zygote has been formed, fertilization has happened. Okay, then this plant embryo, but remember it's going to be dormant. Okay, a mature seed, the plant is not growing and developing until con environmental conditions have to be right for it to start germination. So there's a dormant plant embryo and it's going to have some kind of food supply. Okay, and it, the food supply, there are two different um, things that can act as a food supply. Okay, so remember the endosperm could act as a food supply with that double fertilization when it forms that endosperm. A cotyledon here, okay, so a cotyledon can also act as a food supply. And the seed also could have both. You see this one in the middle there? It's got both endosperm as well as cotyledons. They can both act as food supplies for the growing, when the plant begins germination, that growing, developing plant. Uh, the cotyledon also uh, may become the first leaves on the plant. So as the plant grows and develops, the first leaves that sh and shoots that pop off the plant could be part of, from that cotyledon. Okay? And again, the cotyledon can also act as a nutrient storage. The seed's also going to have some kind of hard protective coating. Okay, it's going to have some kind of seed coat on it. Okay, let me see. There's a seed coat on this one, on this one. But they have to have some kind of seed coat. They have to have some kind of hard protective coating so that the embryo will survive while it's dormant. Okay, so when the plant embryo is dormant, the seed is not growing. Okay, so there is obviously no growth during dormancy. Okay, so I've got no growth happening during dormancy. Metabolism is virtually non-existent. Okay, not necessarily completely stopped, but really slow. Okay, so metabolism is virtually um, stopped, completely non-existent. And then environmental conditions have to be just right for the seed to break out of this dormancy. Um, mainly, we need water conditions and temperature conditions. Okay, those are your two big environmental conditions that will really determine when the seed is going to be able to break dormancy. And breaking dormancy is controlled by enzymes and hormones. Okay, plants have a significant amount of enzymes and hormones in them, okay, just like animals do. And when, they are, when these environmental conditions are met and the plant's ready to break dormancy, okay, that will be a, basically a chemical reaction that's controlled by enzymes and hormones. Okay, so let's look at what's happening now then once the plant has to, once the seed has decided to break dormancy. Okay, so 
When the seed breaks dormancy, what we have happening here is germination. 